Describing exactly what kind of film The Shape of Water is will be quite difficult. On the surface, it's exactly what you might think a Cold War era monster movie might be, and it encompasses all of the themes that you'd expect from 1962 Baltimore. A unifying fear of Russia, the expectation of a nuclear family, and music by the likes of Glenn Miller. But on a less obvious level, it's this fantastic fairy tale that implements narrative elements you might find in stories like Cinderella or Beauty and the Beast. Combining these two very opposing story elements has been very well done. From the set design, cinematography, and makeup artist, I think we're actually able to identify the characteristics of each story element by identifying the colors that are used in the film. The primary color scheme for the film shows us that green, emerald, and teal colors are what encompass a lot of the film, which, I mean, is quite obvious throughout its runtime. The laboratory and institution very much represent this color scheme, along with much more of the film. These color combinations are what's known as analogous on the color wheel. By using colors that are close to one another, it creates a calm look that's often found in nature. These colors are found in a lot of the lives of each of the characters. Eliza and Zelda wear these green uniforms to work. Giles forces himself to eat key lime pie in order to talk to the server at the diner. He even gets told that green is the future by his ex-boss. Looking at these, it seems like all that's coated in green are representations of old world values. The server turns out to be homophobic and racist. The uniforms that Eliza and Zelda wear for their cleaning jobs are expectations of women in the 60s, as well as the need for Giles to change his painting to what his ex-boss thinks is the colour of a nuclear family type future. I think it's safe to say that throughout the film, the green tint to the world that Eliza lives is representative of traditional values that conflicts with her as a character, as well as Zelda, Giles and Dimitri. The attitude of these characters reflect the colour that they inhabit. This is why red is introduced into the film slowly. The colour red is accumulated by Eliza as her relationship with the amphibian man develops, and she opposes the normal values that everyone around her conforms to. I think that the colour red was chosen for this representation because it's an opposing colour to green on the colour wheel, which makes Eliza stand out in the film, because she isn't a normal character. She's the princess without a voice. These colours mirror the changes that each character goes through. The first time Eliza sees the amphibian man, she is cleaning Strickland's blood. And slowly through the film, she accumulates red shoes, a red coat, and a red bandana, as she falls deeper and deeper in love with the amphibian man. She finds herself to be loved for the first time, and fulfills her desire to be understood by someone. She goes from a deaf cleaner to a lover. While this is happening, the characters around her begin to become themselves, and follow in her footsteps. Giles realises that the diner server isn't who he thought he might be, and gives up on the advertising business knowing that they won't hire him because of his sexuality. Once he starts to help Eliza, he grows his hair back and ditches his toupee upon realising his sense of self-worth. Dimitri opposes both of his countries in trying to maintain his scientific integrity. Zelda continuously shows her independence in the face of racism and inequality, leading up to the confrontation with Strickland where she maintains her belief. Strickland himself is so obsessed with conformity that he does things that he hates. He buys a car that's coloured green, a colour that he doesn't like simply because he's told that it's teal and he's the man of the future. He's in an unhappy marriage with a wife and kids, simply because it's what's expected of him. He even tells Dimitri that throughout his entire life, he does what he's told. After all of this, his confrontation with General Hoyt sets him undone. His whole world is a lie, and it's because of the people who rejected the norms of society that made it happen. There's a lot to look at in terms of hidden meaning and symbolism in the film. The Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure argues for what's known as semiotic theory that would explain a lot of what we see in The Shape of Water. He argues that we will always see a signifier, which is the form a sign will take place in. This sign is the signified, a concept that the form represents, which I know is a bit confusing, but it's pretty simple in reality. An example of this would be the eggs that are continuously featured in the film. 
In reality, there's no reason why I would call them eggs, other than it was once decided by someone that that's what they're called. And so eggs could carry any other meaning that we would give them. And so the meaning that we give them is carried by the letters that make up the name for an egg. In this case, fertility might be attached to the eggs in this film. Eliza begins her relationship with the amphibian man by giving him her eggs. And as her relationship progresses, she will eventually uh, give him her other eggs. In this scene, we see Eliza waiting for her bus to come. Sitting next to her is a man waiting with a cake. This could be a symbol for the majority of people having a desire for a lot of different things in a person. Whereas Eliza only carries eggs. Just having a single ingredient leaves her short of wanting what everyone else wants. This could be what she wants in the amphibian man. Semiotic theory can be used to explain the way that green and red are implemented into the film. The meticulous design of the world that these characters inhabit tells us a story that only the medium of film is able to get across. I'm so glad that the filmmakers could tell us this fairy tale in a wholly unique way. Thanks everyone for watching the video up until this point. I hope you liked everything I've had to say. If you've made it this far, then please leave a rating to let me know what you thought. Last time I asked you to write, always wear a helmet if you got to this point in the video. So this time I'm going to ask you to write, world's finest grain. Okay guys, that's it for me. Make sure to subscribe to see more videos. My name is James Hayes, and thank you for watching.